Welcome to Postcards, a brief look at people, places, the arts and curiosities from around the world. On today's program, the chance to own a piece of musical history, Yehudi Menuhin's Violins on Auction. Also at Sotheby's, the annual Haute Couture sale. We look at the successful blend of cultures in North England's Bradford. How an artist is using his passion for animals to help protect them. And encouraging another kind of artist, the graffitiist. But first up, collectors from around the world flock to Birmingham in the Midlands for Britain's biggest sale of antiques. The annual Antiques for Everyone Fair has something for all tastes and budgets. From Victorian napkins through to silver jewellery, pottery, porcelain and ceramics. Going for a song, a classic harp priced at $20,000 US is aimed at the serious collector. But most of the half a million items up for sale at the fair can be snapped up for a modest sum. Dealers realise that casual buyers and browsers represent a big slice of the market. The fair also covers furniture, instruments, glass and textiles. There isn't much that's been made over the years that isn't represented here. There are, of course, the classic collectibles that come with equally extravagant price tags. This work by Flemish painter Pierre-Jean Van de Oudre is one of the most expensive items on offer at $264,000 US. Big buyers are alerted to lucrative investments via the internet. Businesses devoted to listing antiques on the World Wide Web have come to Birmingham to lure buyers and sellers to their service. The network has around 5,000 dealers represented from 10 countries. On the average month, there are approximately 3 million hits to the website. But most buyers prefer to be able to see and touch the items on offer. For keen window shoppers, the antiques fair is a whole day's entertainment. For sellers, personal contact with their clients means the vital delivery of that all-important sales pitch. This is a superb example of a solid rosewood ladies' work table with a rising top, beautifully fitted interior. Attracting more than 25,000 visitors, the Antiques for Everyone exhibition proves that relics from the past are still very much alive as an interest and investment for the future. He was acclaimed as one of the greatest musicians of the 20th century. He had his first lesson at four and went on to stun audiences throughout his entire career, renowned for his fresh, natural style of playing. Recently, music lovers the world over were given the opportunity to own a piece of his rich musical legacy. Forty of Yehudi Menuhin's violins and bows would be auctioned at Sotheby's. The collection is estimated to raise around $800,000 US. Menuhin chose to play on two Stradivarius during his concert career. The first, which he played for a number of years, was given to him in 1929. The second is now played by Itchak Perliman. He sold both of the Strads in the 1980s. He played few of the violins in the collection, but this one, made by Giovanni Grancino in Milan in about 1695, Menuhin played for his Carnegie Hall debut when he was 11. His first violin is one of the most valued items in the collection. It's reckoned to fetch between $64,000 and $96,000 US. The collection also includes instruments from the great violin cities of Cremona and Venice, as well as rare bows from Paris. Another highlight, this violin, estimated to reach between $112,000 and $160,000 US. It was crafted by Giovanni Maria del Busetto, a master among the great Cremonese instrument makers. This particular violin belonged to Menuhin's teacher, George Inesco. Inesco bequeathed it to Menuhin shortly before his death. Truly unique among the lots on offer is this violin, complete with a hand-carved image of Lord Menuhin. And bows, handmade by Francois Tort. Lord Menuhin also leaves behind him one of his most enduring legacies, the Yehudi Menuhin School for Talented Young String Players, founded in 1963 in Surrey, England.
From the elegance of Christian Dior to the psychedelic and the tasty, it was a true celebration of fashion in the 20th century. Aptly named Passion for Fashion, the auction, an annual event at Sotheby's in London, attracts worldwide attention. But it's not only from the fashion industry. Interest also comes from private collectors, fashion historians and museums. But that's hardly surprising. It's one of the only places you can buy the old and the new creations of nearly all the famous and not so famous fashion designers. From Coco Chanel and Christian Dior to more recent names like Ozzy Clark and Vivian Westwood. The items have come from all over the world, some taken from fashion houses, others from the depths of bedroom wardrobes. This auction had the Lady Karina Frost collection of Ozzy Clark pieces, an Emilio Pucci collection from the States, a Vivian Westwood from London, and Schlumberger haute couture from Paris. And for anyone looking for that special outfit, this could be the place to shop. If you're daring enough, you could always go for this Vivian Westwood creation, complete with mirrored fig leaf. And if that's not quite your style, there's always this Givenchy purple puff ball. Or a classic ball gown, courtesy of John Galliano. The sale also featured the Patrick Litchfield collection of fashion photographs. It's the first time his work has been sold at auction. Many of the items fetched prices that far exceeded catalogue estimates. The 1933 Hermes woolen ski suit, here on the right, sold for $26,000 US, more than three times the pre-sale expectations. This Chanel olive green dress with chocolate brown tulle fetched $27,600 US, the second highest price of the auction. A celebration of art and design of the last century. More than 65 dealers from Europe and the United States joined British fellows for the 20th century at Olympia exhibition. The best of what was made throughout the 20th century. The designers and artists range from the more traditional arts and crafts movement through Art Nouveau to those of the present day. With prices ranging from $32 US to tens of thousands, the organisers claim the show appeals to everyone. And for many, it's a great place to pick up a gift or something a little different maybe for themselves. Whether they want to buy pictures, furniture or some ceramics or glass, the choice is right across the board. One of the highlights of the show is Design for Outrage, an exhibit capturing the punk movement of the 70s. It features original clothing from Sex, Vivian Westwood and Malcolm McLaren's King's Road Shop that offered the very first punk clothing. There's also promotional posters for the Sex Pistols and famous photographs of the era. These visual forms of dissent in the mid-70s forced themselves into the public eye. They are amazingly powerful images, even now they've escaped from the immediate hysteria of that time. A new shape for the new millennium? This furniture by John Makepeace is the very latest in British design. And the unmistakable beauty of Claris Cliff Pottery. Then, just to really test your eyes, there's Michael Juchet's open kinetic art. And by the end of all that, if you can't possibly look at anything else, there's plenty of records to take you back in time. In 1972, Ugandan dictator Idi Amin expelled 80,000 Asians from the country, claiming they were Britain's responsibility. Thousands, though, became stateless refugees, falling under the care of United Nations refugee agencies. Since coming to power, Amin believed the solution to Uganda's economic difficulties was to return the Asian population to Britain. Amin claimed Uganda's Asian population was milking the economy and denying the country's African population what he said was their rightful share of the benefits of economic independence. 50,000 of those exiled held British passports and after a century of life in Africa they were forced to start all over again in a new country. Bradford in England's north became home to many of the Ugandan refugees. 27 years on, the city is a thriving multicultural metropolis. (laughs) 
Bombay Stores is a family-run business entering its third decade of trading. What started out as a small concern catering for the needs of Bradford's mainly Pakistani and Indian populations has over the years developed into a multi-million dollar export business. Now, in addition to saris and silks, Bombay Stores is the largest supplier of bridal fabrics in the north. Hark's multicultural supermarket is another success story, which has capitalised on integration. With over 10,000 product lines, the supermarket attracts customers from a variety of backgrounds, but remains true to its Islamic principles. Salim Ahmed had no experience in food retailing, but decided to found his supermarket on a basic business tenet. See what's missing and determine how you can do it better. He saw a hole in the market for Asian shopping a need to expand from the small corner shop to the largest supermarket form of shopping. The philosophy has paid off. The supermarket is now undergoing a major overhaul and while the diverse range of spices, sauces, pulses, rices and flowers will remain, the store will be more modern in appearance. Harks currently turns over $3.2 million US annually. Following the refurbishment, it's expected that figure will reach nearly 5 million US. The next stage for Harks is the rollout of more stores in Muslim and Southern Asian communities across Britain. Curry is now the most popular takeaway dish in Britain, having even overtaken fish and chips. There are over 3,000 Asian restaurants in London alone, but few are as successful as Bradford's Mumtaz. The business is another family venture which strictly adheres to the recipes of the family's matriarch. The restaurant is undergoing a major expansion, which will cater for as many as 500 patrons. However, Mumtaz's most recent success has come from the frozen food market, a multi-million pound enterprise in its own right. But for the second generation British Asian, food and fashion are making way for industries of the future. Four years ago, 34-year-old Anuja Rahaja spotted a yet-to-be-unexploited business opportunity. After working as the public relations and marketing manager for Asian satellite broadcaster ZTV, Rahaja realised there was huge commercial potential in marketing Asian business in the UK. Media Moguls was born in a back room, simply with the aid of a laptop computer. Today the company is flourishing, employing a modest 13 staff members. Anuja says that after being diagnosed with a neuromuscular disease when she was 18, She's driven herself twice as hard as her peers. She believes if you have a dream and are prepared to make sacrifices, that you can be successful. Today her client list includes Cobra Beers, her former employer ZTV and EMI's Asian Music Division. Yet commerce is not the only area in which members of an immigrant Asian community have made their presence felt in Britain. In 1952 a young woman came to Britain to study law. Early on, it was clear this Asian girl was not one for intimidation. One of only eight women in a class of 80 students, her early experiences fueled the self-confidence to go into public life. Baroness Flather became Mayor of Windsor and Maidenhead, 
an accomplishment she says was incredible, not because she thought she couldn't do it, but because of the community beliefs at the time. Her achievements culminated in a seat in the House of Lords. Last year, the so-called Brown Pound was worth £7.5 billion, pounds, or $12 billion US to Britain's national coffers. As the next millennium approaches, the influence from the subcontinent will be felt primarily in commerce. On current trends, the typical British economist and business school graduate will soon be predominantly of Asian background. Inside this converted farmhouse in a tranquil village in Surrey, it's not surprising to find an artist hard at work. But for David Shepherd, it's not the rolling hills outside his window that inspire him, but the threatened wildlife of Asia and Africa. Paintings of tigers, elephants and rhinos have been tumbling from his easel for the last 40 years. But animals are more than a source of inspiration for him. Protecting them is his passion. Shepard realised his blossoming career was due to the wildlife he painted and decided he had to do something for them in return. He started by using the proceeds of his picture sales to fund conservation projects. But in the early 1980s, David decided to get involved directly in protecting creatures like these from those hunting them illegally for their horns, hides or bone. So in 1984 he set up a foundation to target funds to run its own conservation projects and work in tandem with governments, trying to protect wild animals from the ravages of the poachers. The foundation is run by Melanie Shepherd, one of David's four daughters. Auctions of pictures by her father and other wildlife artists, fundraising talks and mail order sales has so far netted over $4.8 million US for the foundation's work. Scenes like these were familiar ones in Africa before the 1989 ban on ivory trading. With some countries in Africa campaigning for the ban to be lifted, Elephant poaching is on the increase again. The foundation is heavily involved in supporting government anti-poaching efforts in Zambia. They've lost 90% of their elephants from the ivory poaching since the early 70s and now have only 25,000 elephants remaining. Poachers are frequently better armed than the scouts trying to protect wildlife. They can afford to be. There's big money to be made in, for example, the trade in rhino horn for use in traditional Chinese medicines. The foundation works to raise awareness in Europe, as well as Asia, of alternatives to rhino horn. Some of the foundation's programs have gained notable success, like the Siberian Tiger Project in the Russian Far East. About five years ago, they numbered around 150 tigers. Through setting up five anti-poaching units throughout the Russian Far East, the population has risen to approximately 400 tigers. But conservationists warn that the recovery of the Siberian tiger is precarious and Asia as a whole has lost over 95% of its tigers in the last 60 years. It's in large measure due to David Shepard's now world famous paintings of the tiger that its plight has gained publicity. The city of Hull in northern England, once a prosperous port, but now fallen on harder times. Here, as in many places, the frustration of young people is often expressed by vandalism and outbreaks of graffiti. Now, Hull's local authority has recognised the creative potential of this phenomenon and created legal sites for graffiti artists across the city. They provide an outlet for an activity that's part of today's youth culture, somewhere they can hone their art skills without taking risks or doing harm. There have been over 100 graffiti workshops so far, attracting children as young as seven. The average age, though, is about 15. The graffiti artists like their names, their tag being seen and recognised. Local companies are also encouraged to donate to help with the costs of paint. The youth centre workers say they're also addressing other social issues. Although it can be vandalism, it can't be denied that some of these works are done by very talented artists.
And finally, whether you're feeding the pigeons in Trafalgar Square, taking a stroll by the grand buildings of Regent Street, or simply waiting for a train at King's Cross, you'll be spending time among some of the most famous streets in the world. Even for those who've never actually visited them, the chances are they've heard of them. Sites such as Piccadilly Circus and Marleybone Station have become immortalised by the Monopoly board. First appearing on the market in 1935, Monopoly has gone on to become the most popular board game ever sold. In just a few short hours, fortunes can be made and lost, players thrown into jail or forced into bankruptcy. But some players see it as more than just a game. These are the English, Northern Ireland, Scottish and Welsh Monopoly champions, all vying for the British title. The showdown taking place in London's Liverpool Street Station. Until this week, the British champion was 39-year-old Englishman Mike Grabsky. His own wife is one of his title-chasing opponents. But after a long battle, it was Jeff Collins from Northern Ireland who emerged as UK champion. With the runners-up, though, all was not lost. They got to play on a $3 million board made of gold, complete with diamond-studded dice, gold houses and hotels encrusted with rubies and sapphires. It's reckoned Monopoly has been played by 500 million people, with the longest game lasting 59 days of continuous play. And that's all for today. Join us again next time for a postcard look at interesting people, places and the arts. <laughs>